Our scripture reading for this morning is John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version as well. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And I, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. As we get started, let me just begin with a, a big thank you to everyone who came out yesterday and volunteered and helped in some capacity with the fall festival. Um, we couldn't have done it without everybody's effort from the, those who came up just to assemble booths for us or those who came up to uh, uh, do security, those who came out to pass out candy, those who ran games, those who fed us while we had good food, uh, especially from that, that varsity waitress that was there. And we just had a great time, and thank you for putting that together. We had a lot of people from our community come out, and it was just a privilege to serve them and to connect with them, and it's because we together were able to do that. So thank you so much for your efforts. And for those of you who didn't come out last night, boo to you. <laughs> Get it? Boo. Yeah, I know Daryl Smith liked that one. But we're grateful you came out. One other thing, we, we're not going to be in the Exodus today, unfortunately, due to the unforeseen circumstances in my life. I did not get to finish preparation for that lesson. So we're going to talk about home still, though. John chapter 14, verses 1 and 3 that Brother Gene read for us a moment ago might be one of the most underrated, beautiful passages in all of Scripture. Because in John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3, we're told that God has a home for us, that Jesus is getting it ready, and that he's coming to get us so he can take us home. It's as simple as that, but it is absolutely beautiful to think about. That God is welcoming you into his house. That Jesus is getting that house ready for you, and that he's going to come and show you the way there. How great is that? But you know, I fear that far too many people cannot grasp how magnificent, how magnificent such a home really is. And I think it's because we can't get beyond our own mortal, earthly understandings. You see, when we depict heaven, there's a few different things we might do. In this world, we'll think about heaven in terms of our own personal experiences. So one thing we'll do, we... We think of heaven almost exotically. It's this otherworldly place, and so we'll try and compare it to exotic locations on this earth and maybe a tropical paradise. And yet the tropical paradise often feels more appealing than heaven because we can lay eyes on it. We can see it. We know what it does to us when we go there. Or we might try to compare it to the happiest place on earth because heaven's supposed to be this place full of joy. And so then we start comparing it to Disneyland. And the experiences we have had in that environment. And we want heaven to be like that. But then we also swing the opposite direction. And sometimes when we depict heaven, particularly in the field of media, they like for heaven to look like a cloud bank. This cloud bank that you're just walking around on emptiness, you just see clouds. Or oftentimes, those of us who have preached have depicted heaven as though it's just one long worship service. And a great many of us sit through some long worship services, and we're kind of like, hey, you know what? I've already gone through that. Let's not do that again. But see, none of those things is what heaven is like. So this morning, I want us to sort of read between the lines of Scripture to see what it's trying to communicate regarding heaven. Because when we do so, I believe we'll realize 
what Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. So turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. There are three descriptions of heaven that I want us to notice in this section of Scripture in particular that I believe will help us unravel the, the, the majesty, the wonder, the greatness of home. I want to start in Revelation chapter 21. We'll start reading there in the first verse. Whoa! All right, let's go home. I'm going to power this down in case it's affecting it right now. All right, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And in verse 5, we add this on. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. What I want you to notice in those verses is the emphasis on newness. As heaven is being depicted here, this new heaven and this new earth, there is a great deal of emphasis on that which is new. We need to realize that there's no place like home because heaven is a place of newness. Now, why is heaven depicted as a, a, a new heaven or described as a new heaven and a new earth? It's because this physical universe that we exist in right now will be destroyed. The first heaven and the first earth are a reference to this planet, consisting of its land, sea, atmosphere, and all of that. And Scripture makes it very clear that this physical world in which we currently exist will stop to exist one day. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, that heaven and earth will pass away. And if you jump over to the book of 2 Peter in verses 11 and 12, Peter just talks about the day when Christ returns and says that on that day, it will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. In other words, Jesus and Peter are both telling us that, hey, this physical realm in which we exist is going to to cease to exist. It's going away. It's going to make room for this new heaven and this new earth. And newness is nice, isn't it? Pictured on the screen is my very first car. It's a 1986 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. My parents bought it brand new off the lot in 1986. I was six years old when they purchased it. Years later, when my brother turned 16, three years ahead of me, they passed this vehicle on to him. Then when I turned 16, they got another vehicle for him to drive and handed that one down to me. Let me call that injustice. <laughs> Completely unfair. So when I graduated college, the very first thing I did, the month I graduated college, I went out and bought a brand new car, a car that was all mine, every mile driven on it except for test drives and getting it to the dealership, was put on there by me. I loved the fact that I had my own new car, that every dent, scratch, smell was my responsibility. See, when I inherited that car, it had not only been used by my parents, now they took pretty good care of it, but they handed it off to my brother. My, my brother, who is a country boy at heart and really desperately wanted a truck, so he decided to slap dual exhaust on that thing and take it mudding. He got it stuck a number of times. I guess he never figured out that without four-wheel drive and a high, uh, uh, some sort of elevation on your, on your wheelbase, you're going to get stuck. And so when I inherited that, the upholstered ceiling was falling down. Some of y'all remember that. The uh, front grill was being kept in place by chewed-up gum 
That's not, I'm not kidding. That is legit. But man, that thing had a V8. I could take anybody at a stoplight. But I had this horrible car, and I couldn't wait to get something new. Here's what I want you to realize. All of us, to some degree, have this joy around something new. Maybe it's a, a new home. Maybe it's a new cell phone. Maybe it's a new outfit. Maybe it's a new toy. But there's something about that new thing that's just yours, and nobody's touched it. Nobody's messed it up yet. And you can just enjoy it. Think about it this way. We entered a world that wasn't brand new. We entered a world world that was already touched, already tainted, already used, and already abused. And what we're being promised in Revelation chapter 21 with a new heaven and a new earth is that this place that Jesus is preparing for us will not be a hand-me-down. It will not be corrupted by previous residents. It will not be tarnished by wear and tear. It's going to be absolutely, perfectly new for you and for me. There's absolutely no place like home because nothing, nothing compares to the newness of this home. And you know what? There's no place like home, not only because heaven is a place of newness, but there's no place like home Because heaven is a place of splendor. Look in Revelation chapter 21 again. Look at verses 18 through 21. This is one of those those sections where it's just very easy for us to skim over it, to read through it, and get get annoyed by having to pronounce things we don't like to pronounce. But in verse 18, the passage reads this. In describing this new heaven and new earth, it says, The wall was built of jasper. While the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh, listen, I had to practice, jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Now, honestly, I don't know if I correctly pronounced all those gems and jewels correctly, but you kind of get the point. The construction of this new heaven and this new earth is, is incredibly unique. And it's worth noting that this description is not meant to be literal. And I think it's kind of evident when you pay attention Consider the fact that in verse 18, John said the city was made out of pure gold like clear glass. If that was the case, how did he see it? Or consider the fact that the gates were made out of single pearls. Have you ever seen a pearl big enough to squeeze through? Or consider the fact that the description of the city's construction is perfect dimensions of a cube that is metaphorically designed to make us think about perfection. So why then are all these gems and precious metals identified if we're not literally going to be walking through gates of pearl or on streets of gold? You have to remember we're dealing dealing with prophecy and apocalyptic literature and things like that These items are symbolic rather than literal. And I believe the lists of gems and precious metals is intentional. I believe those building materials of heaven are provided for two primary reasons. One, I think they speak to the worth of heaven. The construction materials mentioned here in Revelation chapter 21 are not common nor cheap. They are precious. They are valuable. They are expensive. And I believe they are identified for the express purpose of conveying to us that heaven is absolutely priceless. No mansion you can find on the face of this earth compares to the value of heaven. No facility 
no building, no construction has the value invested into God's house. It's worth way more than you could find anything on Zillow. It is absolutely priceless. On top of that, when we start reading about these gems and these precious metals, I think they convey something that we often miss because we can't see it with our eyes while we read it. These precious metals include the entire rainbow of colors. The entire array of colors available to the human eye essentially get depicted in these precious gems. You have the red of jasper, the blue of sapphire, the green of emerald, the black of onyx, the brown of carnelian, the the yellow of topaz, the orange of jacinth, the violet of amethyst, and so on. You have all these beautiful colors depicted by these gems. Heaven will be a visual spectacle like, unlike anything you've ever seen before. And so I think the other reason these precious metals and precious gems are mentioned is so that we understand that heaven is going to be absolutely beautiful. Think about one of the most beautiful scenes you've ever laid eyes on. Maybe it was the Grand Canyon. Maybe it was Niagara Falls. Maybe it was the sunset off of some tropical island. Maybe it was a a, a snow-covered mountain or a glacier. You name it. It pales in comparison to what heaven's going to be. The beauty of heaven, far greater than any beauty you can find on this created earth, And I believe that John is trying to communicate that in the human words, in human words that he can muster for something he can't experience humanly. Our human eyes can't comprehend heaven. And John's doing his best with the words that we can understand to depict something we would never fathom seeing. And so there's no place like home, not only because heaven's going to be new, but also because heaven is a place of splendor. But you know, there's one other thing we need to acknowledge about heaven that makes it so grand, that makes it so wonderful. And that is that heaven is a place of reward. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not claiming that heaven is a reward, as if it's something that we earn. That's not the case. Heaven is an inheritance graciously given to us by our Heavenly Father. And this is made abundantly clear in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3-4, through 4, where, where uh, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Heaven is an inheritance, not something we earn. Because you have to realize that an inheritance, that's not a wage. An inheritance is a gift freely bestowed upon those who are rightful heirs. So heaven itself is not a reward, but Scripture repeatedly refers to God as a rewarder. And his people as recipients of a reward. Three times in Matthew chapter 6, as Jesus addressed the proper attitude toward giving, praying, and fasting, he said, your father who sees in secret will reward you. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we are told that without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And in Mark chapter 9 and verse 41, Jesus said, For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now we could spend a lot of time debating what the reward is. 
But what I wanted to accomplish right now is just show you that Scripture is filled with passages that speak of a, a reward. Now, turn your attention to Matthew 25 with me. To one of the more, most popular parables Jesus ever told, or it's the parable of the talents. And when you get to Matthew chapter 25, in the midst of the parable of the talents, you'll read these words. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, one thing you ought to notice is that the parable of the talents is in a series of parables. And if you go back to the the start of the chapter, you'll notice notice that there's, there's a reference to the fact that these parables are intended to show us what the kingdom of heaven will be like. So the parable of the talents is a parable that has kingdom implication. And there are two things that stand out to me regarding our reward when we look at what the master said to his faithful servants. First, I believe it shows that God will reward us with a personal commendation. To both of the faithful servants... What did the master say? Come on, you know it. What did he say? You can speak. Well done, good and faithful servant. There is a, uh, there is a, a, a praise being given. There is commendation being given. See, when we stand before Christ on the day of judgment and we're deemed good and faithful, I believe the Bible has told us that there is going to be some form of commendation given to us by the Lord. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. He said, Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. There's a lot to look forward to in heaven. But I look forward to the day that I hear my father look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You ever ever sought appreciation from someone you respect. Maybe it was your parents and you're just hoping your mom or your dad would see what you did and be like, I'm so proud of you. Maybe it was an employer, a boss who who saw the work you did and they're like, hey, great job. Maybe it was a coach or a teacher who you you were trying to impress and you just wanted to get to that point where they they said, hey, I'm, I'm proud of you. Good work. You're doing great. There's a lot of joy, a lot of reward found in such commendations. And Scripture alludes to the fact that one day the faithful will receive that from the Lord. Picture on the screen in the red suit is Bjorn, and I can't pronounce his last name, Dali, I think is how it's pronounced. He's from Norway. And he's the most successful cross-country skier of all time. Over the course of four Olympiads, he won eight gold medals and four silver medals. This picture was taken at the conclusion of the 10,000-kilometer cross-country ski race at the 1998 Winter Olympics, 
where Bjorn had just won gold for the third straight time. The young man that he's greeting is named Philip Boyt. Philip is from Kenya, and he was the first Kenyan to ever participate in the Winter Olympics. Apparently, he had never seen snow in his life until two years earlier when he decided to try to get into the Winter Olympics. Out of 92 race finishers, Philip finished 92. Bjorn completed the race 30 minutes prior to Philip, and Olympic officials tried to move forward with the award ceremony before Philip crossed the line. The only problem was that Bjorn wouldn't go to the podium because Bjorn wanted to wait at the finish line for Philip. He wanted to be there when Philip finished. He wanted to be there to greet Philip because he believed that Philip deserved that recognition. Imagine this. Can you imagine Jesus waiting for you at the gates of heaven? We haven't run the race as well as he's run it. But he's waiting at that finish line because he wants to greet you. He wants to say, well done, good and faithful servant. There's no place like home. When you think about it like that, there is absolutely no place like home. A place where you get to see Jesus face to face. And when you do, he's praising you. There's no place like home. And not only do I believe that reward will one day consummate itself in a personal commendation, but I think more importantly, it will involve an eternal celebration. Going back to the parable of the talents, the master said, well done, good and faithful servant, but he said something else that's very significant to both of those, to both of those servants. He said, enter into the joy of your master. Another translation says, come and share your master's happiness. You know what part of the reward is going to be? It's going to be permanent joy. Won't that be nice? Don't you love it when you're getting to experience joy? Maybe, maybe your team upset Alabama. Maybe you remember your wedding day and the joy that brought Maybe you remember the birth of your child and how great that was. That joy, don't you wish you could hold on to it all the time? Never let that go? Because that's what heaven's going to be. That permanent state of joy. Enter into the joy of your master. Now I want you to understand there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is not a biblical pursuit, technically speaking. It's, it's an American pursuit, let's be honest. Do you know why the Bible does not endorse the pursuit of happiness? Because happiness is circumstantial. Your happiness is tied to your circumstances, and that means as circumstances fluctuate, so does your level of happiness. But joy, joy is constant. Heaven is going to be absent all of those circumstances that prevent you from being permanently happy. There's not going to be any pain or loss or evil in heaven to negatively affect our happiness. So when we hear the words, enter into the joy of your master, what it's saying is we're going to be rewarded with permanent happiness. Happiness that's never affected. True, eternal joy. It's interesting, though, if you go to Matthew chapter 5, where we have the Beatitudes. And that word translated blessed at the start of every one of those Beatitudes can technically be translated happy. And so I want you to look at the Beatitudes again. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so on. And it seems to imply that happiness, because it's contingent on circumstances, can only be attained when we're in the kingdom of heaven. And I think it's worth pointing out that at the conclusion of this passage on the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. See, there's no place like home. Because our eternal home is the one place where circumstances can't change our emotions. Because there's nothing to affect our joy. We will actually get to experience permanent happiness because we'll be in the presence of our Master. I think it's important every once in a while to just be reminded of what we're moving toward, where our journey is taking us. Home. Because sometimes it gets very easy for us to take our eyes off of the destination. With everything that happens around us and all the chaos and all the frustration and all the pain and agony, it's very easy for us to forget where we're going. It's very important for us to fix our eyes back on it. Pictured on the screen is a little fish, a little minnow-like fish. He lives in Central and South America, and he's affectionately called Four Eyes. This name is derived from the fact that God made this little guy with a unique set of eyes. His eyes are situated on his head so that he can spend his time cruising along the surface of the water with the upper half of his eye above the water line and the lower half of his eye below the water line. So this little guy legitimately is looking in two worlds at once. He can see above and he can see below all at the same time. That's how we're supposed to exist. Eyes set on above. Focused on where we're going. But also aware of what we're doing down here. This morning is a call, a reminder a challenge to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on home. Remember to where it is you are going. Because if we accept, if we realize, if we believe that there's no place like home, then there's nowhere we'll want to be besides there. This morning, We gather here, we study God's word, we praise him, we speak to him in prayer, and now we extend this invitation. If something needs to change in your life so that you can make it home, if you need to talk to somebody about God's word and find out what it is you need to do to secure your way home, if you've gotten off course and you need to come back, If you need the prayers of brothers and sisters in Christ to help you through difficult times, whatever your need is, we extend this invitation because we all want to get home. If you have any need to respond, then we encourage you to come down front while together we stand and